Alright, how are we? Let me ask you guys a question. How excited are you really to be at the largest real estate event in the history of Remax of Brazil? This has been an incredible experience. And I'll tell you this, this is my first time to Brazil and it will not be my last time to Brazil. You guys are all my new friends. And I'll do anything, you guys will learn this as you get to know me, I'll do anything to help you. Anything in the world, you have an amazing country. And I'll tell you something else that I, I found really amazing is the history of Remax in Brazil. When I first agreed to come here and speak at R4 in, in Vegas with Pachudo, we talked for five minutes and, and he did a video and all of a sudden I'm on my way to Brazil in a couple months. But I had no idea the history of Remax in Brazil. I had no idea that you are only 10 years old as a company in Brazil. And it's astonishing to me that you are where you are right now with over 200 offices, 2,500 agents. Give it up. You guys are amazing. It's really incredible. Um, I am truly impressed and proud of each and every person in this room for the accomplishments that you guys have made. And the way I see it, after coming here and learning a little bit about the differences in the, the US and the Brazilian real estate industry, I see nothing but huge opportunity and potential for Remax in Brazil to continue to continue, because you already are the market leader, but to continue to be the market leader and continue growing. You have to continue listening to your leaders. Pichuto had a baby boy last night. Can you guys believe that? Give it up for Pichuto real quick. He couldn't be with us. What an amazing person. I've got to know him very well. Incredible leader for you guys. Renato, where is Renato? Give Renato a big hand. These two gentlemen have sacrificed so much for you to be here. And they've put their heart and soul into building what is a monster company in Brazil. And I'll tell you this, and I promise you this, there's good things coming for you, and the best is yet to come for Remax of Brazil. A little bit about me. Uh, I started real estate 17 years ago. I've always operated as a single agent. Me and my father, we are classified as a team in the Remax system, but we, we operate as single agents. Okay, I've been the number one team leader in the state of Alabama for Remax three times. I've won the Diamond Award three times. And for the last two years, I've grossed over a million dollars a year as a single agent in commissions. Now I get all the claps and all that sounds amazing and incredible, but the truth is, it hasn't always been that glamorous. I grew up roofing houses for years and years and years in the hot sun. One of the most grueling jobs out there. My father did it. He roofed houses for 30 years. He was the oldest man on the roof, still out working everybody. And that's really what gave me my work ethic, is watching him work so hard. But I knew I didn't want to do that forever. So when I was 20, I got my real estate license. By 23, I'm a self-made millionaire only to become completely bankrupt, lose everything, everything. 
I'm sleeping on friends' couches. I'm sleeping in my car. I went back to roofing houses. I worked on an oil rig for a while. And I even battled with drugs and alcohol. I had a battle with drugs and alcohol. But you know what? Through all that, winners, winners just find a way. They just figure it out. They find a way to win. They don't make excuses. They find solutions. Five years ago, 2014, I completely won my battle with drugs and alcohol. Not a single sip. Coincidentally, that happens to be the same year that I sell 100 properties as a single agent. And since 2014, I've sold 100 properties, over 100 properties, every single year since. That's 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, going on 19, 21, 22, 23. I also wrote two books. And I started coaching real estate agents. And I've become known as the first completely free real estate coach in the world. We have over 14,000 agents in the program worldwide. I just hit over a million views on YouTube and I have a podcast that gets over 50,000 downloads a month and growing like crazy. All this while I'm continuing to sell 100 properties a year, year over year over year over year. So you see, winners find a way. And what I want for everybody in here, if you don't get anything out of my talk today, I want you to get this one thing. I want all of you to find your way to win. I want you to figure it out. Because winners, sometimes you look at somebody who's really winning and you say, how did that happen? And nobody can really tell you. Sometimes there's an it factor. You don't know what it is, but they got it. And I want you to find your it, your way to win. So the biggest two questions that I get from real estate agents are, Ricky, why? Why are you coaching for free? And how? How do you continue to sell 100 properties a year as a single agent? So that's what I wanna to do today. I wanna to take this opportunity to answer these questions for you. I want to share a little bit about my journey and everything I've learned along the way. Does that sound good? Yeah. Your success in real estate and in business and in life is going to come down to just one thing. Making people feel comfortable with you. Making people feel comfortable with you, with who you are. Now, I could have said all kinds of things right there, and you probably thought I was going to say several different things. The cliche things, right? It comes down to, I could have said, working hard, being a hard worker. I could have said, your success will come down to being professional. I could have said it, it comes down to being honest. 
But let's, let's be real. If you're in this room right now, and you want to be, you're here because you want to be a top producer. How many people here want to be a top producer? Okay then, everybody. If you are in this room and you want to be a top producer, I shouldn't have to tell you that you gotta work hard. I shouldn't have to tell you that you need to be honest or professional. That should be automatic. I should never have to tell you that that's what you need to do. You need to automatically be doing those things. What I want to do is share something with you that maybe you haven't thought of. Why? Because I want to help you. I want to bring value to you. And I want to open up your mind to maybe a different skill that people don't necessarily talk about all the time that could really help you. And that is making people feel comfortable with you. If your client or your prospect feels comfortable with you, there's a good chance you're going to do business. On the other hand, if they do not feel comfortable with you, there's a good chance that you're not going to do business. So how do we make people feel comfortable with us? The most simple way that I can explain it to make someone feel comfortable with you, all you have to do is be comfortable with them. If you're comfortable with them, they will feel that and they will in turn be comfortable with you. If you're nervous, if you're scared, if you're trembling, if you're not relaxed, if you're tight, they feel that energy they feel that nervousness and if you're nervous now they're gonna be nervous and they're gonna say I don't know if I want to do business with this agent something's they're scared something's going on here however if you are calm cool collected tone of your voice speed of your voice body language if everything is lining up that you are comfortable with them that's the first step to making this person your new client. So at my workshop Wednesday, we did an exercise. I wanna explain the exercise to you right here so that you can start to try to apply this in your day to day. Okay, I made up this exercise a couple months ago when I started thinking about this. And how can I help people get into the right mind frame to be comfortable with strangers? Because not everybody has that. And so what I eventually came up with, and, and I kind of created a term. It's, it's called FE. And it stands for friend or family effect. And the idea is that we want them to feel like they're a friend or family. We want our clients to feel like they are our friends and family. Okay, so how do we translate this? Next time that you're talking to your mom, your dad, your brother, your best friend, somebody that you feel really, really comfortable with, I want you to just pay attention to that conversation. I want you to really think when you're talking to this person that you feel so comfortable with. You can tell them anything, they can tell you anything. They're comfortable with you, you're comfortable with them, everything's great. That's what you need to emulate with your clients. That's how your clients need to feel. So what I want you to do is, next time you're having that conversation with someone, I want you to take a mental snapshot. I want you to, I want you to take that moment in time and just think about the tone of your voice, the speed of your voice, your, your body language. Are you tight? Are you loose? I want you to pay attention to every little piece of the communication between you and this person. I want you to start trying to emulate that when you talk to your clients. And it won't happen overnight. It will not happen the first time, maybe not the second time, maybe not for a week, two weeks, a month, but maybe in a week, two, three, four, um, uh, uh, a couple months later, 
Maybe you start to feel a little more comfortable with people and you see their reaction of how they're comfortable with you because of it, and then you start doing it more. And you do it with more clients, and more clients, and more clients, and before you know it, you have a huge army of clients who all see you as friend or family. So I want you guys to start thinking about this and paying attention to how to make people feel comfortable with you. Because this is what's going to determine your success, because you all want to be top producers. So you should already be working hard, being honest and professional. I want you to add this to your arsenal. So it all started for me in Orange Beach, Alabama. I brought a couple pictures for you guys to see. It's right on the beach, right on the Florida, Alabama line. I'm literally two miles, I live two miles from this beach and I live two miles from the Florida state line. I have my Florida license, so I sell in Florida and Alabama. I do mostly in Alabama. Taxes are much cheaper there, so most people buy there, but I still do a lot in, in Florida as well. 20,000 population. Think about it for just a second, because I think Sao Paulo is 12 million. This is 20,000. However, 6 million visitors. 6 million people a year visit our beaches. White powder sands. It is a beautiful place. I'm very blessed to have grown up there. Actually, I didn't realize how good I had it until I left and tried to travel around and go to college and stuff before I realized I grew up in the middle of paradise. You know, as a kid, you take things for granted. You know, I grew up at the beach, and so I just thought every little kid had a beach. It's not true. I've sold condos in all the buildings. So I started in 2002. I was 20 years old. I knew I didn't run a roof houses forever, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I tried college. College was not for me. I went to four different schools, colleges in two years. I failed a history class and decided I was not going to move forward with college. I realized that to get a license where I am, it's one class, and I saw that as my opportunity. I jumped on it. I barely passed the class, I barely passed the test, and now I'm a real estate agent. I was still roofing houses. So I told my father, I said, I'm done roofing houses, man, I got my real estate license. Done, see ya. I went in the office, worked every day, full time. 30 days goes by, zero sales. Not even close. I have to go back to roofing houses. Now I'm roofing houses and trying to sell real estate and trying to figure out real estate at the same time. It took me eight long months to make my first sale. And actually, it was my grandmother condo, I can't even lie. I did sell another condo right there, kind of back to back. Then I started selling two a month. Selling two, two deals a month for a little while. This is getting into 2003. About midway through 2003, the market starts to explode. Prices doubled, nearly doubled, in, in a span of about two years. Mid-2003 to about mid-2005, prices nearly doubled. I believe they did if we go back and look in my area. And so here I am. I'm a 21-year-old, 22-year-old, and the market explodes. And I was literally in the right place at the right time. And I started to make some serious money. But the problem was I didn't know what to do with it. I was buying Hummers and Cadillacs and houses. But I also tried to invest. And this is what eventually took me out. 
I bought lots of properties. I was flipping them. I was not thinking long term. I was thinking short term. The market started to crash. 2005, prices started to come down where I was. I'm sitting here trying to hang on, hang on, hang on, because everybody was saying, just give it two years, the market will come back. Two years will go by, give it two more years, the market will come back. It was the longest crash we've ever seen in my lifetime. Any money that I had in reserves, I spent it all trying to survive, trying to keep these properties. I ended up losing everything. All the cash, all the properties, nothing. Totally broke, totally bankrupt. I was down to zero. Didn't even have a car. Somebody gave me their car because they felt bad. So here I am. Just a couple years ago, I'm on top of the world, and now I'm completely at minus. I'm not even at zero. I'm less than zero. I'm in the hole. So I immediately go back to roofing. And now I'm roofing again. I just can't get away from it. So I'm roofing houses, and basically I'm starting over. Because here, here's, here's how I think about it and how my life has went. Wherever I am is fine. I can't really control where I am necessarily, but I'm always going to move, be moving up from there. So if I make it to a certain point, get knocked down, that's fine with me. Wherever I'm at at that point, I'm just going to keep moving up and keep getting better every day. So when I lost everything, I literally, I, w I, was, I was not sad. I'll tell you, I was more sad in 2015, the year after I made 600,000, that I wasn't gonna make a million. I was more sad then than I was when I had nothing. I was happy because I was 23 and there were, there were gentlemen who were in their 40s and 50s and 60s right next to me that lost everything. And I was thanking God that I wasn't in their shoes and I was 23 and I was able to rebuild and learn from my mistakes. And I knew that's what I was going to do. I knew that I was going to learn and rebuild and make it better than it was. And that's what happened. So during that time, I was so curious. I wanted to know so badly why I failed. Sure, I bought the properties, but I wasn't able to continue selling, selling real estate either. You know, what's going on? I can't do anything. There are people successful out there. Why not me? I'm the hardest working person I know. I'm the most honest person that I know. I want it more than anyone. Why am I failing and why can't I create momentum? So through my thirst and curiosity of wanting to know, I started reading. Over a two year period, I read over a hundred books. And I was on the oil rig too, by the way, as somewhere along the line there, 2007, January 2007, I landed a job on the oil rig working every other week. I said, great, I can work one week on the oil rig and come home and work on real estate. Back on the oil rig, back to real estate. And this could be my way back into the real estate game because I have time a whole week to do nothing but focus on real estate. It didn't work that way because the oil rig is hard work and you're so tired, it takes you a couple days to recover and then you, you work from six in the evening till six in the morning one week, and then when you go back, you work from six in the morning to six in the evening, and they switch it up every other week. You're, you, you can't concentrate uh, long enough to sit down and try to, it wasn't like I thought it was gonna be, in other words. But I was able to read and learn. I was paying attention to the market. I was watching the market. I was watching the closed sales. I was watching the, the prices. I was watching everything from afar. I still had my license. I was still active. I still, that was one thing that I maintained. The only two things that I maintained through this was my license and my cell phone. 
I still have the same cell phone number that I had when I was 18. Those are the only two things that I kept current. I had nothing else. I had no other bills. Couldn't afford it. When I started working in the oil rig, I was making 5000 a month and I was just saving it. I didn't want to spend anything. I just want to save up. But something clicked at some point in one of those books that made me realize where I had went wrong. I realized that up to that point in my career, it was all about the money. It was all about the transaction, the closing. When I first got in real estate, my thought was literally, I want to help people. I want to help first-time home buyers. I want to help people. I just want to help. But somewhere in the mix with the market exploding and all this money coming in, I lost sight of that. And it turned into how much money I could make. And is the, literally the reason why I lost everything. It wasn't because I bought so many properties and had a million and a half in debt that I couldn't pay. I could have paid it if I valued relationships over transactions because I would have continued selling properties through that downturn enough to pay the note to then figure out how I wanted to handle the situation. So you see, at that point, something clicked and I realized it's not the money, it's about the people. Now this was just a thought at this point. This wasn't anything that I have tested yet. This was just something that I realized that this could be the, the missing piece of the puzzle for me. So 2008, January, I worked on the oil rig for one year. I got laid off because gas prices went down. They started laying off people. I eventually got laid off. I was the hardest working guy out there. They kept me out of 57 people. I was the last guy. They tried to hang on to me as long as they could. I got laid off and luckily enough, I was already dabbling in real estate just a little bit. I was already trying to talk to people about buying and selling just a little bit. And when I got laid off, I had a couple deals happening. And within 45 days after I got laid off from the oil rig, I had a closing. So this was 2008. The last sale that I had before that was 2005. I sold nothing between 2005 and 2008. Not a single closing. I was roofing houses, reading books, and working on an oil rig. That was my job. So when I made this next sale in 2008, I was like, thank you, God. Because I didn't know if I would ever sell real estate again. And when I made that next sale, and I knew that the relationships over transactions philosophy was real because I could see it in my clients. I was already seeing that people were feeling more comfortable with me, long term. I, th I was thinking so short term in the beginning. Short term gets you nowhere, not even in the short term. When you think long term, you make short term money right now. So 2008, what I did is I devised this plan. I wanted to be the best. I wanted to be number one. I'm going to put this relationships over transactions philosophy to work. So when I got back in real estate, there's lots of foreclosures. 2008, tons of foreclosures. In my, in my little small area, there was maybe 50 at a time for buyers to choose from. Bank owned properties, foreclosures. And everybody was so jealous of the foreclosure agents that were getting the listings from the banks. Super jealous. And I, I kind of was one of them for a second. And I looked into it and I found out how much work those agents had to actually do to, to get their name on the list with the bank to get those listings. And I said, I'm not interested in that. Okay, another key point is the fact that every time I called one of those agents who had a foreclosure listings, didn't answer the phone, wouldn't call you back, wouldn't email you back, wouldn't do anything. Why? 
because they were taking orders from the bank, getting all these listings. They didn't have to worry about customer service. They didn't have to worry about answering phones or, or helping you. They weren't worried about it because they knew the properties were going to sell. So it hit me. I knew exactly what I was going to do. I was going to take advantage of this opportunity. What I was going to do, this was the plan I created to become number one in my area. I visualized this. I, I, I saw the whole thing happening. I knew it would take some years, but I saw this whole thing unfolding right before my eyes. I said to myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent the buyers buying these properties. I'm going to treat them like family. And in three years when the market rebounds and these, these properties are worth more, those, my clients, are going to sell the foreclosure property and buy another property and refer all their friends and family to me. And what's going to happen to the foreclosure agents that are sitting right here not answering their phones? They're not going to be in the business anymore. And that's exactly what happened. All the foreclosure agents from back in the day, 2008, 2009, 2010, they're not around anymore. Because they can't operate like a real estate professional who handles clients' needs operates. They're just taking orders from the banks. They made a lot of money when the market crashed, but who's laughing now? So that, that was my theory. And then I just completely committed to it. I want to sell as many foreclosures as I can. Also, I want to go after listings. So 2008, I make $80,000. Twice as much as I made on the oil rig the year before. I was ecstatic. 2009, I make $100,000. I'm ecstatic. 2010, 2010, 2010 was one of the most interesting years in my career. It was the year of the BP oil spill. Do we know the BP oil spill? It was a, it was, there was an explosion of an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Millions and millions of gallons of oil was spilt in the Gulf of Mexico. They pumped a lot of um, solution down there to try to dilute the oil. And it was chemicals. So the media blew that situation up. Everybody was scared to come to the beach. I'm on the beach and, and there's oil washing up on the beach, not really. There was no oil that washed up on the beach, but we didn't know what was gonna happen. Maybe oil might have washed up on the beach. We didn't know, nobody knew. It was a lot of uncertainty. Everybody was scared. So we had zero visitors in my area that year. They didn't want to come down with their families, scared of the poisons in the water. Nobody knew anything. The market, we had what's, what we call a mini recession. A mini recession. And everybody was scared. And I looked at it as an opportunity. An opportunity to take everything that I learned in the big crash the huge crash that we just had, I lost everything and now I'm back in the business. This is my opportunity to test everything that I learned there in this little mini crash. We didn't know it was a mini crash. It could have been a big crash. I mean, there could have been oil. That, why, who, we didn't know. But I took it as an opportunity and I remember being in my office, I was with a different company at the time, and I told all the agents in the, in the, in the office, I said, look guys, stay calm. This is okay. You need to call all your clients right now and start keeping them informed every step of the way. Everything we know, every time we hear something about the oil spill, every time we get any kind of news, let's be the bearer of news. Let's, let's tell people what's going on. Let's make sure that they're informed and we're the ones keeping them informed. And then let's see if there's anything we can do to help them. Are they looking to dump their properties because they're scared of the oil? Did they want to buy property because other people are dumping properties? So people, sellers, 
sold their properties for cheap. It was about a six month window where everybody was really scared. And, and when I listed those properties, they wanted to dump their properties, I wanted to list their properties. Somebody wanted to buy the properties really cheap, I wanted to sell them the properties for really cheap. This is what happens in a market crash. Prices go down, buyers come in. Transactions continue to happen. So here I was, in 2009 I made 100,000. 2010 we have the BP oil spill, mini recession, I make $150,000. An increase of 50% in a down year, a scary year. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was my aha moment. That was when I realized that it, I didn't necessarily have it all figured out, but I was on to something really good. And my goal with, with real estate, and my goal for everybody here, is to create a business that, that produces consistent closings every month. Your bills come in every month. You need closings every month. And that was something that, that I could, it took me a while to, to get a handle on how to make the closings consistent. But when I realized relationships over transactions, that changed the game. And when I, when I realized my aha moment and that I could make it regardless of what the market does, that's when I decided I wanted to move to the company that I had always wanted to be with the number one company for real estate in the world, Remax. I was excited because I'd always wanted to be at Remax. All the best agents are at Remax, right? Not just rah rah, it's the facts. The best agents are at Remax. We're the, we're the number one office in my area. We sell more property than anybody. Our market share is ridiculous. We're at 30 something percent. The next closest person is under 10 percent. The next closest uh, office. Nobody sells more than Remax. That's where I wanted to be. So now here I am with the best company. I've reached, my, I've reached my goal to get to the best company in the area, and now I want to be the best agent at the best company in the area. So I combined everything I was doing with the number one brand in the world, and I started getting, this, is, this was what, I really started crushing it. So I'm, I'm doing well, I'm making money, I hire an assistant. By the way, when I, when I hired my assistant, I had 30 listings. 30 listings for me was the point where I needed an assistant because I had so many show and requests coming in from other agents, I couldn't handle it all. So I hired my assistant, she took that over, I'm able to get back to my clients, helping them, talking to them, figuring out what I can do to help them. She processes everything, now we, we got a good thing going. 2014 was the year that I sold 100 properties for the first time. Me and my father were the number one team uh, in the state, and I personally made $600,000 that year. 2015, I wanted to make a million dollars, because my income had went up each year, pretty substantially. And my goal for all my life has always been to make a million dollars. I grew up in a blue collar family with no money, okay? We didn't know what a million dollars felt like. When I made a million dollars when I was 23, the reason I lost is because nobody, we, we didn't know what to do with that money. Never had that much money. So my goal was always to make a million dollars in a year. And I was not going to stop till I got there. So I put this plan together. Just like I put the plan together about the foreclosures, I put the plan together to make a million dollars. I need to make this many calls, talk to this many people, go to this many appointments, do this many listings and I'll have this many closings and I'll make a million dollars. So January rolls around, I start my mission. I start executing my plan. February rolls around, March, 
and I'm looking at the numbers and I'm realizing I'm going to make 600,000 again. That's when I became, I wouldn't say depressed because that just is not even in my vocabulary, but I was frustrated. I was upset with myself. Why can't I do this? I know what I need to do. Why can't I do it? And I was frustrated. So I started another curious curiosity mission. I went back to reading. What am I doing wrong? I'm reading. I'm watching. I'm watching YouTube videos. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm studying. I'm Googling stuff about agents that are selling like 500 million in a year and reading their stories and stuff and trying to figure out if there's something they're doing that I'm not. What are they doing that I can implement? What's the secret sauce? And through that, somehow I landed a coach. It was kind of like a last resort. I was like, man, I can't figure this out. I just need to just hire somebody and let them tell me how to do it, and then I'll just do it. So I hired the coach, and I said, coach, I want 100 listings. If I get 100 listings, then that means I'll probably make a million dollars. He said, okay. So we got to work, and we did the same old song and dance, expires for sale by owners, same old broken scripts, high pressure, handle objections. All that stuff, all those scripts are designed to figure out what the client can do for the agent. Hey, Mr. Seller, will you sell your property so I can make a commission? And if not, if you can't help me by selling your property so I can make money, who do you know? Can, will you give me all your friends and family's information? You don't know me. I could be a scammer. But give me all your, give me all your friends and family and tell me everything you're going to do, all your financial plans. Right? And if you say no, I'm going to throw some objection handlers at you to try to get you to, to do it even though you don't want to. That's trying to figure out what the client can do for the agent. What I'm doing with my coaching program is I'm trying to teach agents how to figure out what the agent can do for the client. So I hired the coach and I'm working hard. I had him for four months and people need a coach for one of three reasons. They either don't know what to do, they need to learn the fundamentals, they know what to do, they just need somebody to hold them accountable, right? They know what to do, they're just not doing it. Or they have some kind of mental block going on that they need to get past. So when I hired the coach, I thought I needed fundamentals because I was dang sure accountable. I just didn't think I was doing the right things. So I hired him and through the process I realized that I did know what to do. I was accountable to myself. I had mental problems. If you make $600,000 and you are upset, you have mental issues. So what I realized through all that, and I talked about it in the interview this morning, you got to believe, you got to work hard, you got to adapt. But the part that I was missing was patience. I was doing all the right things. I just wasn't being patient enough. Then I started to implement being patient and just putting the work in and not focusing on the results. When you create a goal, a yearly goal, I want you to think of that goal as a source of motivation. If you, I want you to work as hard as you can to accomplish that goal, but I do not want you to be down on yourself if you don't hit the goal because you can't control the results. The only thing that you can truly control are your daily actions. The only reason you should be down on yourself if you don't hit your goals is because you know in your, in your heart that you didn't put the actions in to achieve the goal. But if you put the actions in to achieve the goal and didn't hit it, that's fine. We're going to try again next year. We're going to try again the year after. 2015, I didn't hit a million. 2016, I didn't hit a million. 2017, I hit a million. So, and I was happy the next year I didn't hit it because I wasn't worried about the end result anymore. I understood patience. So at that point, the rest is really history. 
Um, I started writing, speaking, coaching, and I just love real estate. I love helping. I love helping my clients. I love helping agents. It's all the same thing to me. Everybody's family. And when you do things without expecting anything in return, that's the best. So let's talk about the three things that I learned through all of this. Okay, because when I hit, when I learned about relationships over transactions, that was just a piece. I didn't know there was more. But, but through my journey, I learned that there were more elements to it. Okay, another big one that I realized. Closings happen every day. Is that what it says? Yes. Closings happen every day regardless of market conditions. I want you to think about this for a second. Closings are happening every single day. They're happening all around you. Every what? Three seconds? 30 seconds? Closings are happening every single day. That's probably across the whole world or something. In your market, closings are happening every day. And what we're doing is, is we're spending too much time on each client. We don't realize that closings are happening every day and we're trying to convert every single last lead. It's okay to spend a lot of time on each client, but no, we, don't need, we, need, to, we need to pay attention to how much time we're spending on each client and make sure that we're leaving room to go after new clients because that's gonna be the key to you unlocking these closings that are happening every single day. When the market crashed on me and I was watching the market like a hawk, I was watching it every day. And sure enough, there were closings happening every day. The prices were coming down, but the closings were still happening. This was big eye-opener for me. And I was watching it, and I was watching it, and I was watching it. And then I realized that some of my clients that I was representing when the market was going up, they were buying at the bottom. They were buying and selling. They were selling their bad assets and buying new ones at, at cheaper prices. They were still doing deals. But because I didn't value the relationship with that person, I, I, didn't, I just lost touch and just let it go and went back to roofing houses and see you later. Because I didn't value the relationship and stay in touch with them and see what I could do to help them through the crash, then I, was, I didn't get involved in those deals. When the market crashes, do not be scared of the market crashing. People buy on the way up, they buy on the way down. When the market crashes, people do one of three things. They buy because it's cheap and they wanna buy right now before it goes up. They sell because they're in trouble. They gotta sell right now, they're in trouble. Or they hold, they're just gonna hang on and ride it out. But they're gonna do one of these three things. Buy now, sell now, or hold. A crash creates so much urgency in the market. And you know what? Most of the agents leave the business. And it leaves so much business for the ones that understand this. And I think Remax of Brazil is gonna understand this when the market crashes and all the other companies will go away and we'll be the only ones left standing when the market crashes. By the way, I'm gonna start making videos around my content uh, translated into Portuguese, just for you guys. <laughs> do you know why I'm gonna do that? Because I love you. Closings happen every day. Do not think about business as a scarcity. Think about it as an abundance. Which brings me to my next point. Business is unlimited. Is that what it says? Good. Business is unlimited for each and every single agent. 
Yeah. You cannot do all the business that is available to you. There's so much business out there, you can't do all the business of this available to you. The amount of people, the amount of loyal clients in the market just for you, there's an unlimited amount of loyal clients just for you, just for you, 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 unlimited, okay? The problem is you haven't put the work in to talk to enough people to find the loyal clients. You're hung up on this open listing that won't convert to an to a, uh, exclusive. You're hung up on trying to figure out how to convert him. When there's all these other people, there's 12 million people out there waiting to hear from you to see how you can help them. So I want you to understand that business is unlimited and, and competition is non-existent. It doesn't exist. And I've, I've touched on this the entire time. Always, in every situation, value relationships over transactions. I've spent some time with Carlos, Moses, Prochetto, all of them. There's a common theme. I watched them speak. There's a common theme with the way that they conduct business. And it revolves around relationships, not the money. If you listen to them, they say the same thing. And it's the same thing I'm saying. And there's agents, there's people in this room right now that think, I don't want to spend time with this client because they're just going to use me. They're going to use me for this, they're going to use me for that. I don't want to spend time with this person. Wrong attitude. You spend time with that person even if they are going to use you. Because what happens is magical. When you show them that you care about them enough to spend time with them and not expect anything in return, all of a sudden, they turn from somebody that was going to use you to now they open up and now they want to do business with you. This is real. But you have to make this mind change. You have to make this mind, this, this mind switch. It all starts up here. It all starts in the mind. Everything. Even the hard work behind being super successful, it's your mind telling you to do it. Everything comes from up here, even the physical part. So, when you're talking to your clients, to your prospects, I want you to have a different tone. I want you to have a different mindset going into these conversations. And I don't want you to necessarily ask them if they want to buy or sell. I want you to tell them you're with Remax of Brazil, a house around the corner sold, and you didn't know if there's anything in the world that you could do for them. They know you're in real estate, they know what you're there to do. Let's open up the conversation of, is there anything I can do for you, as opposed to, do you wanna buy, do you wanna sell? Because they hear that from every agent out there, and it's making prospects run for the hills. They don't want an agent that's just trying to do a deal with them. They want an agent that cares about what's going on with them. So my number one way to go deeper with the relationship is once I do encounter a prospect that wants to buy or sell something, my main objective at that point is to find out why they're buying or selling. What's going on in their life? They didn't just wake up one day and say, I wanna buy, I wanna sell a property for no reason, no. Their mom died, their kids went to college, they got a new job, they're relocating, something's going on bigger in their life. The, the selling or buying of the property is like small potatoes compared to the bigger reason of what's making them, causing them to make this decision. 
And if we can find out the reason why they're buying or selling and then focus on that and relate ourselves to that, then it's over. We have went deep with the relationship and now we're there to help them accomplish their bigger life goals, not just buying or selling real estate. The buying or selling real estate is just extra credit. It's just a cherry on top. What I want you to do is I want you to stop trying to convert so hard and I want you to connect first and then convert. Connect with your clients first and that may take some time. But once you feel that connection, now we're gonna start the conversion process. Does this make sense? Let's get loud one good time. Let's get loud one good time. Yeah. I want you to be 95% low pressure and 5% high pressure. Just don't use that 5% until you know it's the right time. And treat your clients like family. I got a bonus one for you. Ricky's Law 5. Yeah. How many people here have lost a deal ever and it hurt? Never have? You get every deal? Okay. Okay, how many people if they lost a deal today, right now, it would hurt. If you lost a deal today, would it hurt? Would it hurt your heart? Heart? Would it sting? Would it make you mad? Listen to me. When you lose a deal, if you go to a listing appointment and the seller is interviewing several agents and they didn't pick you, Oh, right? If you show a buyer a bunch of properties, they either don't buy, maybe you try to call them, they don't call you back, they just disappear, or maybe they buy something through another agent. Hurts, right? Let me tell you why these situations are the greatest thing that could happen to you. Again, I want, I want to change your mindset here. I want to put you in a position to multiply your business. I want you to do more deals. Here's the facts. You can't control if that's which agent that seller is going to choose. You can't control it. You can't control what that buyer is going to do. He's going to do whatever he does. You can't control those things. So you can't worry about it. But here's what happens that's magical. When you lose a deal, number one, you learn something. That's cliche, everybody knows that. Learn from your mistakes, right? But when you replay whatever happened during that, during that communication with that person, buyer or seller, in your mind, and you realize maybe what you could have done differently, that makes you a better agent. But let me tell you the most interesting part of losing a deal. The future time that you get back that you don't have to deal, you don't have to work on that deal anymore. If you get the listing, you have to sign the listing, you have to take it to them, you gotta take pictures, you gotta put a sign up, you gotta put it on ML, or y'all don't have MLS. You gotta market it, however you guys market your, your listings. You have to deal with people wanting to show the listings, you gotta deal with buyers, we get a contract, now we gotta negotiate it, now we're under contract, now we're dealing with the closing. We got the title company or whatever you guys have to close, the inspectors, the lenders, it's a lot of stuff. Hours and hours and hours go into each deal. What we don't realize when you lose the deal is you just got all those hours of your life back that you can use because it's in the future. It's an amazing opportunity if you think about the future time you get back from lost deals that you can now take 
this knowledge that you learn from losing the deal and the future time and go get five more deals, right? So let me tell you the law of five and I want you, all of you to do this. Next time that you lose a deal, I want you to set the stopwatch on your phone for five minutes. I want to give yourself, I want you to give yourself five minutes to think about it and to sulk about it and to be sad about it and think about what you could have done differently. And as soon as the timer goes off on that five minutes, I want you to completely forget about that deal and move on to more deals. Why? Because business is unlimited. Closings are happening every day. Competition doesn't exist. So that's the law of five. Take five minutes after every lost deal, realize the future time you just got back and whatever the lesson was that you learned from that lost deal and go get five more deals in the same time that it would have taken you to do that deal. So, I'm on social media. If you guys wanna follow me there, if you can reach out anytime. I answer every single message, every single DM. I'm here to help you in any way that I can. Um, my time here in Brazil, let me tell you guys, this has been unforgettable. This has been amazing. I really, to be honest with you, didn't know what to expect going into it, but you guys have definitely over-delivered, okay? Um, and like I said from the beginning, all of you are my friends now, and I'm gonna do anything and everything that I can do to help you moving forward, to help Remax of Brazil continue to be the market leader and get better and better and better. So with that, um, I want to leave you with a couple of things. The, the main thing is this. Now that I've been out of the country, now that I've experienced a completely different market halfway around the world, I realized one really, really important thing. And that is that relationships are universal. Relationships are universal. People just want to know that you care about them. I don't care what country you're from. I don't care where, where you are. People just want to know that you care. They don't care what you know. They just want to know that you care. Relationships are 100% universal. And you guys have showed that to me. And talking to Carlos, talking to Moses, these guys have the whole entire game figured out. And I encourage you to reach out to these, these guys and, and, and the rest of the Platinum Top 10 Award winners because you'd be surprised how, how willing they are to help you and to share with you what they're doing because you know why? They understand what I'm saying when I say business is unlimited and competition doesn't exist. Back home, I'm coaching for free, and I put my entire county worth of agents, I just put them in the program. I just put them in there. I didn't ask them, I just put them in there. And they started getting emails from me every day with my YouTube videos and my podcasts and everything else. With my entire coaching program, everything that I'm doing, I sold more property than anybody in our, in our county last year out of all the companies. They have the number one agent in their county giving them their playbook every day. And I've been doing it for two years. Why? Because I understand that it doesn't matter if I tell my competition what I'm doing. It's unlimited. You can't do it all. I haven't lost a single client. No one has said, you know, this guy sounds like you, Ricky. Nothing. All it has done is create more respect and business 
People want to do business with me because I'm giving back so much. When I first started doing it, agents in my office thought I was crazy. Crazy. Some of them were even mad. But I didn't listen to them because I knew what I knew. And that was that this business is 100% unlimited. I'm going to leave you with this. Real estate is a people business. Real estate is a people business. And if you quit chasing deals, then the people in your market that you want to do business with will love you. Thank you guys so much.